Thank you. All right, just real quickly introductions. I'm hoping Alok will be joining us here quickly or we'll move our agenda around as, as needed. Um, I am Linda DeChambeau with Contra Costa Climate Leaders and uh, Andrew Johnson has been an intern and worked with our group. Uh, we call it 4CL, because that's a mouthful, Contra Costa County Climate Leaders, 4CL. Andrew's been with 4CL for a few years now. He's a UCLA grad and uh, he's an environmental consultant. And uh, myself, I am an environmental scientist and a former mayor of Moraga. Um, I had, did policy work. Actually, first I did bench work as a chemist in the environmental laboratories for many years. Then I did federal policy for the US EPA and retired from there after 21 years. And then I did local policy um, as a local mayor. And I really feel that the most impact we can have for addressing the climate emergency mm -hmm. is what we can do at our local city levels. I'll start and I'll end with my favorite quote is I really do believe that local actions move the world. And I'm happy that all of you are here today to join us to hear um, this organization was uh, founded rather than run for any more terms as a local elected. I really found it was important to know what other cities were doing and sharing best practices. Something a lot of people don't realize is that um, small towns, you're a volunteer. I still went to work and commuted to San Francisco. I came home late at night to go to late night meetings. And how do you drive policy when you're really focused on police fire roads, police fire roads? So 4CL was formed to share best practices on what other cities are doing on important topics. And today's topic is on microgrids and backup energy storage. And we have some great examples of what cities are doing. Super important when cities um, are finding themselves down for a short period of time. How do they have a cooling center for their elderly and children? How do they keep their schools going? You know, Aloka, if he joins us, we'll touch into some of that um, a little bit more. But this is really something interesting, and it's done in multiple ways. Some cities are truly off the grid as a microgrid. Some cities are just doing it as backup energy, and in most cases, um, and what we're promoting is that that's done by uh, renewable energy as your backup source, not the old-fashioned uh, gasoline. So that's what we're doing today. That's who I am and uh, founder of 4CL. I want to thank our sponsors. Um, MCE is uh, with us today and has been a big supporter of our work. Um, MDRR, Mount Diablo Recovery and Recycling, has been a big supporter. Um, our fellow advocates are uh, Climate Reality. Fred is here with us, Wei Tai is here, and a bunch of other people um, are uh, Climate Reality trained. We also have 350 Contra Costa. 350 is also like Climate Reality. It was started by Al Gore is a national, uh, and so is uh, is 350.org, started by Mill McKibben. We have our own Contra Costa uh, group and uh, Greenbelt Alliance. I don't know if Victor made it on the line, but Victor's been a big supporter of ours. So with um, a lot of that uh, kind of out of the way, I um, and I've asked if there's still some people joining us. We've got 45 people, but we had 83 sign up. But if you haven't yet, uh, and we'll save the chat, please introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, just uh, where you're from. And um, we were going to do a poll here. I think um, maybe we should go ahead with the poll. So um, we've got a question for everybody to know if you have a microgrid. And I guess it could also say, or battery backup storage, because you'll find that microgrid, a true microgrid is being loosely defined. But if you, does your city have a microgrid and or backup storage? And um, the options are, if you know you do, if you know you don't, if you think you've got one in progress or something coming to your city soon, and if you just don't know that you're here today to just find out, or maybe you're not, um, you're a city leader, but maybe not an elected or staff official. We have a mix here today of uh, city leaders. Our name, Climate Leaders, is not us as the climate leaders. We are only a network. We consider the climate leaders, all of you who are joining us today um, and who do work. Ideally, it's elected officials and city staff but it's also a lot of um, advocates who take the time and effort to work with their cities, go to city meetings and advocate for policy to reduce greenhouse gases and um, drive policy to address the climate crisis, the climate emergency that we're facing. 
So if anyone's having a problem seeing that, maybe put it in the chat, but I think all of you should have that um, up on your screen. Looks like 38 of us have responded so far. Give that a couple more minutes. Has Alok joined us yet? Don't see him. It looks like Tony sent him an updated link though, so that's good. Tony's with Gridscape as well. Great, thank you, Tony. Tony, I know Alok sent uh, me this morning his PowerPoint presentation. So before we close the poll, I guess, um, or do you want to? I, I can close it right now. Yeah, it looks like we were about 40. Most of us responded. So okay. I'll share the results. So I think maybe uh, the one that got almost the most votes that I don't know, maybe after this workshop today, you'll go back to your cities and try to find out um, what they're doing with it. Are they thinking about it? Do they have one in progress? Maybe it's a city like Fremont who put theirs on a microgrid uh, years ago. Um, their fire stations in the city of Fremont are, are all on a microgrid and they're actually looking at eight more buildings. So perhaps the answer could be somewhere in between yes and yes, yes and in progress. Um, and uh, maybe some of the no's could turn to in progress. We're gonna have a lot of good resources here um, and see what uh, what comes out from today. So that's uh, that's pretty interesting. 41% do not have a microgrid yet. One of the things we do at Contra Costa Climate Leaders is to try to promote cutting edge technologies. One of the things we're gonna hear a little bit more about today is funding and opportunities, perhaps barriers, maybe in the past, we're gonna hear, I think from Ross Moore, um, I don't know if Moraga is going to chime in, but other cities that have tried to do this or pass it have just um, not gone through the process yet. Maybe all that will change. So anyway, thank you for that introductory poll. And still looking. Tony, have you heard back from Alok? Can we promote or un un unmute Tony for a minute? Because he might have a better, um, give us an update. Tony, do you know uh, if something is, is he okay? Is there anything that we need to be worried about? Tony, your speaker should be on. Yeah, you should be. Tony, can you speak? That's okay. Maybe, maybe we could we have Sebastian go with his presentation while, while we wait? Or? Well, that's what I'm thinking. Or I think I might in, um, encourage Brendan to. So um, okay. Brendan is with the Contra Costa County. So we have an interesting county in Contra Costa. We have 19 cities and then we have the county. In some cases, in, in, uh, in some counties, we really find that the um, counties really um, act as an umbrella for other cities. And a lot of them are well-funded with franchise fees and things. Um, but we have a, a, a small but robust group here in our Contra Costa County. And uh, often they struggle with the same local government issues, politics, funding that our 19 cities do. But um, I've asked Brendan to join us and uh, give us a quick update on what is going on at the county level. So, um, and maybe you can even touch on Jody London is our sustainability director and uh, your role, Brendan. And uh, why don't you just give us uh, three, three to five minutes of what's going on in the county specifically um, if microgrids are being considered. So the county has a um, board of supervisors. Um, that uh, Brendan and his team reports to as the decision makers. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Brendan Havener-Doughton. I'm the energy manager for 
um, Contra Costa County Public Works. Uh, I'm in the Capital Projects Division. Um, most of my scope of work is focused uh, inward on county operations and infrastructure. Um, so I do get to be community facing uh, from now, you know, now and again, and I and I work closely with our sustainability team, which is in uh, the Department of Conservation and Development, uh, led by Jody London. Um, so my scope of work really involves distributed energy resources uh, for the most part. Um, we have five pillars to that DER plan. Um, we've got our, our, our general you know, energy efficiency upgrades, uh, demand response, battery storage, solar and, and renewables, and, um, and EV charging. Currently, my... Um, priority project that's that's uh, funded is the EV charging piece. Uh, the county has um, has uh, taken a bold step towards fleet electrification and uh, has required all new purchasing uh, vehicles to be zero emission vehicles. So primarily um, uh, electric vehicles for the most part. Um, and so again, right now I'm I'm designing and implementing uh, EV charging infrastructure across many sites over the, uh, across the county, primarily for fleet charging. Um, one opportunity, we, we do have three uh, 500 kW batteries uh, installed and, and energized uh, right now at, across the county at our facilities. And we have a fourth that is um, going in in Richmond, uh, at the West County Detention Facility, where um, we are essentially going to be um, installing a microgrid. Um, it's going to be providing dedicated backup power to uh, a bank of EV chargers. So we're able to, to kind of leverage uh, the fact that we've been investing in charging infrastructure um, and we have uh, an outstanding um, uh, incentive from the SGIP program that maybe some of you are familiar with um, to do another 500 kW battery to back up about probably four or five circuits that's, that are gonna have maybe 16 ports, uh, charging ports on, um, uh, in, in terms of power sharing, we're gonna have multiple ports on, uh, on fewer circuits. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that, um, but essentially it's, it's a pretty cool project where you know, we'll have EV charging, um, you know, that's grid independent if, if there were to be some type of outage. And that would be serving primarily uh, fleet vehicles in the sheriff's office. Um, so, you know, some of their non-emergency response vehicles, but as they um, start to purchase uh, code three emergency response electric vehicles, um, we, we would have, you know, the infrastructure will be there for them to, um, to charge, uh, you know, it, independent of the grid. Um, and so that's it's a nice little case study um, to come uh, as we as we look at kind of this being our first you know microgrid if you will. Um, the other three battery projects are um, essentially just doing energy arbitrage and peak demand shaving. And so, in other words, they're just um, optimizing our utility bill. There's no back dedicated backup. Um, for these batteries uh, or circuits that they're they're providing backup to, so I do think that's a you know it was an epiphany for me at one point um, you know that you know once even though we have batteries in some cases they're not always providing the backup that's an extra added um, uh, element of a project design that that certainly Gridscape can talk to um, to talk about that. Um, the county and you know the installation of these three batteries were prior to my uh, coming joining the county, um, but frankly they they were paid for in full uh, through the SGIP program. And so um, you know I think it was easy to say yes, um, but when you look at that that cost um, and 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 the relative benefit, and a lot of it comes in the form of resiliency, um, it still is is pretty. You know, dramatically high, and so I, I'm I'm impressed to to learn that there are some public agencies that are coming out of pocket um, for for batteries. Uh, but I think it's it's a lot of times when the resiliency case is is pretty, uh, or the the value of resiliency is pretty high um, 
or they need that resiliency for something really critical. Um, so anyhow, that's, you know, that's just a snapshot of uh, the county. Um, we're working um, to, you know, really make progress on all of our distributed energy resources and integrate them uh, to the to the fullest extent to help, you know, with grid capacity, grid stability, uh, and then also, you know, doing our best to, to reduce emissions. Great. Thank you, Brendan. I'm happy to report that Alok is here and has joined us. I do see a couple questions popping up in the chat. Honestly, we don't have a ton of time. I'll be honest, the way we've set this up, elected officials and city staff are super busy. We try to do this fast, furious, but when we're done, you know where to uh, reach Brendan and you'll know where to reach other folks. Um, at the end of the day, I will send out not only the recording, but a fact sheet with everybody's information. So I think we have a look on the phone and we're going to do a little hybrid here because we're having technical difficulties and I have his PDF. So it might look a little odd, but I think we're going to make this work. So a look, can you hear us? And can we yeah, hear you? Thank you so much. Yeah, All right. So, so we'll sorry. go through this in old school. You just tell me next and I'll move to the next slide yeah. and we'll make this work. Um, by right. the way, um, so Alok um, Singhania's um, bio is in your materials. And like I said, uh, the goal for today is to make sure you have so much information, you know where to go next to get your answers. So go ahead. Hi, can everyone hear me? Hello. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Just making sure <laughs> I'm having, I'm so sorry. I'm having a technical difficulty. I've got into this endless loop where I'm trying to sign in and I say sign in and it keeps telling me register again. And then it keeps going back and forth. So Linda, you're going to see maybe eight registration requests from me. <laughs> that. Anyway. Okay. And I don't know if you have <laughs> well, your own PowerPoint in front of you, but I've got yes, it open on page one. I do. So I will walk you, I will talk about it. So on the first slide, you have a link called Gridscape Case Studies link. Uh, if you click on it, whenever you, you want to, it'll show you some of the material that Gridscape has on various cities. And I'll leave it at that. Um, if you go to that first slide, second slide, I think. Yep, background. Uh, and so this is, this particular slide is, you know, I mean, you already know about it, that we have all sorts of energy laws and mandates to move towards clean energy. And a microgrid is an attempt to, to meet those uh, laws and mandates. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Uh, you know, I, again, I wanted to set the stage up as to sort of how, how the power grid is, is set up today and how we think it's going to happen over the next 20, 25 years. If you think about it for the last hundred years, the, the grid is a really a one-way flow of electricity. You have a whole bunch of power plants and you have transmission lines and you have distribution lines and then through which you get your energy. Uh, it worked really well for the longest period because A, you couldn't produce uh, energy at a local site and B, um, um, you know, that's how things were done and there was really no need to change it. But as we move towards, there's a bit of a problem with that. And as you know, the problem is that the transmission line then becomes a point of failure. Uh, if a particular power plant is off or the transmission line has to be shut off for many reasons, whether it's fire, threats or earthquake or any other reason, then you're not going to get power for the entire sector that, that supports it. So moving forward, what we think need, things need to happen is we need to have a distributed power generation grid where you have a bunch of local power generation, you have a bunch of power plants, and they are connected to each other, and they sort of work in tandem with each other to make the grid stable. And have power available to everyone 24 by seven. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, so, so where do microgrids of distributed energy resources fall in? And the, the only thing that you really need to think about it is a microgrid is like a local power plant. It's a local power plant for your site. Uh, that means you're generating electricity 
and you're consuming most of it internally for that particular site, and you become independent of the utilities depending on the size of the system, 70, 80, 90, 100%. Uh, uh, independent of the utilities, any excess that you have or any need the grid might have, the local power plant will be able to supply that to grid. So that's really is sort of the basic concept behind microgrid is ability to have power independent of the utilities. You're still connected to it. So when it's raining a lot, then you can still get power from it. But by and large, you're independent from it. And when the grid needs power, like for example, extreme heat times or, or uh, peak times, you can provide power to that. If you go to the next slide. Yep. So, so again, uh, I already talked about it, so I won't spend too much time on it, but essentially think of microgrid as a smart energy management for your site and a local power plant. And that's sort of, uh, um, sort of adds to the concept we talked about. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So why do we critical facilities need microgrid? The first, critical facilities by definition need power all the time. If you're running a fire station or you're a police station or an emergency center, or uh, you want to provide shelter during earthquake or extreme heat or power failure events, you really need power at that time. Uh, currently, people use diesel gen sets as a backup, uh, which is fine. A, it's highly polluting. Uh, B, you may not get diesel uh, when you need it. If there's an earthquake and the diesel supplies are cut off, what are you going to do? You won't be able to use the diesel gen set. So the solution really is, in some ways, as I described earlier, that what you want is a local sustainable power plant that gives you backup during the disruption. So that is a main goal of a microgrid, apart from making you independent of the utilities, uh, most of the time is to provide power when the power is out. And then the diesel gen sets, if you have them, become backup to backup, and you mostly won't even need it. If you go to the next slide. I think uh, this is the what one that's with duck and dragon curve. No, the next slide says, what is microgrid? You don't have that? Yep. Sorry, I, oh, okay. So, so, you know, I talked about microgrid, but what is in a microgrid? So microgrid in a very simple way is some sort of local power generation, mostly solar, but it can be wind. It actually can be generator uh, if you have a site that's not connected to utilities at all and you cannot get solar or wind, then you can actually put a generator, maybe a hydrogen power generator at some point in time in life. Uh, and then you have a battery storage system and you have a bunch of very smart software. and and lastly, what it needs is ability to disconnect from the grid. And the reason why you need ability to disconnect from the grid is if power is out and you're not disconnected from the grid, then you have to shut your entire system down. That has to do with backflow of the electricity. So microgrids are very, very simple. Power generation, a storage system, some smart software, and ability to disconnect from the grid when power is out and connect it back to the grid when power is back on. Go to the next slide. So microgrid in some ways is sort of sits in the middle of all your load needs, whether the loads are EV fleet no loads or it's the um, load that you have for the building. Of course, it's connected to the utility uh, so that you can get power in case uh, renewable energy power fails and you don't have diesel, I mean, and you don't have um, any ability to run the diesel gen set uh, and utility is on, then you want to be able to take it from the utility. For example, if you have seven days of rain and you're not producing enough solar, then you're still dependent on the utility for that. But hopefully your dependence on the utility is no more than five or 10% of the entire usage that you have throughout the year. Go to the next slide. Uh, 
Linda, are we taking questions from people or um, let me just go through or I'll just- I'll um, just go through, through your presentation. Okay, all right. So a quick, quick note about Gridscape. Uh, we are one of the largest microgrid uh, provider, renewable energy microgrid provider in California. We have about 65 of these microgrids either deployed or in contract to deploy. Uh, and um, again, we specialize in what we call small to mid-sized microgrids. Uh, small microgrids are your fire stations, uh, police stations, libraries a little bit larger, city hall maybe can fall in that category. Mid-site would be a college campus, or if you have a city that has a bunch of buildings together, that could also act as a campus. And that's what we specialize in. If you go into the next slide, uh, this is just some marketing material. I'll just leave that for you. Uh, we've been on the news. It's a new marketing material. Um, again, this is some of the testimonials. Uh, and I'll have a little bit more information on each of those uh, in the next couple of slides. But we've been uh, obviously in the business for about 10 years. Uh, and we've done many successful um, uh, microgrid projects and people, our customers have been, have been uh, uh, very helpful in giving us their testimonials. Uh, this is just a quick example of what's really going on in real life. Uh, we, we did a microgrid for a tribe, uh, Indian tribe up uh, down in San Diego and they have about seven or eight buildings that are connected to this microgrid. You see the picture. And they are essentially able to run their entire site uh, on this microgrid, and they've had many power failures, and we've been able to support them. Um, the, we do two, we have two hotels uh, with microgrids here in Milpitas, and there was a power shortage about five hour, for five, uh, five hours, I think earlier this year, and none of the residents or the hotel managers saw any blip, uh, and it continued to run. Their, their site. So this is just an example of what microgrid can do. You take the next slide. Uh, I think the next slide is what is our differentiator, right, Linda? Yes. I'm yes. not quite sure. Yeah. And so what makes us different, and this is just a very important point that I want to make, is a lot of microgrids today are what, what I call custom made. That means they take different components and they integrate them on site. That works just fine if you're doing one or two of them uh, and you may have you know, good technicians who can do the work. But if you want to really scale microgrids, that means you want to put a large number of them. And you also want to make sure that they work, their quality is good, then you want to manufacture them. So what Gridscape has done is it has created a, a what I call vertically integrated microgrid that ranges from 75 kilowatt hour, which goes into a very small fire station to a college campus, and we manufacture them. The goal behind that is that you have high quality. If one system works, everything is going to work because it's exactly the same system that gets deployed. And then the other more important, I won't go into too much of it, is really it's the software that drives all of that because A, you want to protect your investment. You want to make sure that if you have an asset that's deployed, then it doesn't go obsolete in five years or 10 years. Uh, and our system, because of its software modular approach, will make sure that your system's life is 25 years, which is the life of a solar system usually. If you go to the next slide, these are some of the pictures of our microgrid. Uh, these are boxes that we manufacture. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, I'll give a little bit of information on what we're doing in four of the cities and give you a little case study. Uh, well, first of all is the city of San Diego. Uh, we contracted with city of San Diego about two, two and a half years ago to, to develop eight microgrids for, <clears throat> for, um, for the city sites. They range from two police stations, two fire stations, and three community centers or rec centers. And uh, we have started construction on them, two construction, 
two site constructions are all done. We have most of the permits in, and we hope to complete all the construction by, by Q1 of next year, and then they'll all get operational. And this particular, what's interesting about this project is this was the first time we created a mechanism, what we call portfolio approach for a microgrid. And the reason why you want to think about portfolio approach is if you were to do only one small site like a fire station or a police station, and you try to see, uh, try to make it work, A, it'll be very expensive. And B, if you were to get, to, uh, get it to try to finance it, you won't be able to find any takers in the market because most financing companies want to finance, they want to finance projects that are worth at least two or $3 million. And so using a portfolio approach, we were able to just make this project about $5 million, a little five and a half million dollars. And it's spread across eight sites. Uh, the total combined solar is 960 kilowatt and about 2.1 megawatt hours of battery system. And again, it's spread across eight sites, the smallest, uh, smallest site, which is a fire station, has maybe 50 kilowatt hours of solar and about 120 kilowatt hour of battery system, and the largest ones are uh, several hundred kilowatt of solar and several hundred kilowatt hour of battery system. But they all behave the same way. And what's interesting about this particular project is that it will save, and this number 6 million was actually calculated two or three years ago, and unfortunately, SDG electricity rates have gone up significantly. So the avoided cost now, uh, or the savings, total savings is now really upwards of $8 million over eight sites. So there is substantial uh, reduction in cost uh, when you deploy these microgrids. And of course, you get the benefit of resiliency as well as benefits of climate action uh, plan. If you go to the next slide, this is, uh, this is the project that we did for City of Fremont. And this has been operation for about five years. Uh, and this one was originally funded by CEC grant of $1.8 million. And then Gridscape put in 600K of match funding to make this work. And, and these fire stations, fire station 11, six and seven uh, are uh, essentially similar size, 50, 60 kilowatt of solar and 120 uh, kilowatt hour of uh, uh, battery systems, microgrid systems. And the savings has been substantial uh, for Fremont. It exceeded their expectation. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, these sites mostly run on, on uh, power produced by, by the microgrid. Now, this one is unique in the sense that this was one of the first ones that we did, and these were one of the first small size microgrid in California itself. And of course, this was made possible because of the grant from CEC, because cost of these microgrids at that time was substantial. The cost now for the same site has been reduced by almost um, 30, well, 50 or 60 percent, or even sometimes even more. We go to the next slide. This is a project that we have installed our, our, our microgrid box. This is our latest design of the box. And we're just waiting for one of the switches to be installed. And this I'm, would be I'm sorry, hello, hello. Can I catch up with you? Are we on Hayward or Fontana? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, this was Hayward. Okay, thank you, sorry. Yeah, no problem. So, so this is Hayward. Uh, this is one site. Uh, there's fire station six. They are rebuilding. They've rebuilt the entire site. There was a general contractor there, and then there was an electrical contractor, and they contacted us to provide a microgrid. And this was interesting in the sense that the space limitation was significant, so we had to redo the design of our system to fit within the space that uh, that existed there. And it turned out to be to be really great because now this is really our new design, and all of our new systems uh, will deploy this design, which are significantly more space 
uh, efficient uh, in the sense. And this particular one, uh, battery capacity is about 231 kilowatt hour. Um, it is not quite our standard. Our standard is sort of more like 225 or 300, but uh, it, we were able to customize it for their need uh, because this was our first uh, setup for this, this particular design. Uh, so this is in Hayward, as I said, this was installed a couple of months, three months ago. It will be operational as soon as uh, the, the new transformer is installed. Go to the next one, which is fun. Here we're doing five microgrids. Uh, two of the sites are completely done. We just got the interconnection agreement from SC after six months. Uh, so we will be able to make it live relatively soon. And the construction for other three, uh, because city didn't want us to start construction on those till we got the interconnection agreement for the first two are going to start soon. And we hopefully will be able to finish that over the next couple of three months. Uh, these are at City Hall, Police Headquarters, Community Centers, PWD, uh, and Community Service Center. Uh, this one uh, doesn't have any fire station, uh, but it has everything else. And again, uh, this design that you see is a slightly previous design. Uh, and so, as you can see, we're, we keep making modifications to our boxes to make it more efficient and um, from a space perspective. Uh, and from a look perspective. Go to the next slide. Um, this is SBBMI. This is the microgrid tribe that I talked about in San Diego. Um, I already talked a little bit about it, but uh, this was funded by DOE uh, completely. And uh, as you can see, um, you know, in Fremont's case, for $2.5 million, we got three fire stations small microgrids, and here we, we're getting a essentially a campus-wide microgrid, which has 480 kilowatt of battery system, 180, watt of, 180 kilowatt of solar system, bunch of charging stations, a generator, uh, primarily because the tribe sits in an area where they get frequent power outages, so they wanted the backup to be a propane generator, and we put that as a, as a backup to backup. Uh, they're saving almost $80,000 a year. Uh, and of course, uh, they're meeting their climate action goal and providing EV charging. One of the things that uh, Tribe, and when we went out, we had an inauguration uh, tour a couple of months ago. And one of the interesting things they talked about, because now they have EV charging there, uh, all their staff have started to buy EVs. And some of the residents are now saying, oh, I think I can buy EV as well because I can charge it free at the, at the, at the charging station that provided by, by this system. Go to the next slide. Uh, we, we are essentially, you know, apart from uh, uh, microgrid for a site, fleet electrification uh, also can use a microgrid primarily if you think about if you have a bunch of medium duty trucks or heavy duty trucks and you want to charge them, the amount of power needed from the utility would be significant and you may or may not be able to get that much power from them. So our, micro, our microgrid really does exactly the same thing. It, it makes you independent from the utility uh, as much as possible and allows you to do fleet charging. If you go to the next slide, uh, I think I already talked about it. The only thing I want to talk about here is that our, our boxes have fire suppression, gas detection, uh, and it meets all the open standards and all the fire station standards uh, just to make sure that everything is safe and it works properly. If you go to the next slide, uh, as part of our microgrid, we provide what we call a dashboard. And these dashboards are essentially gives you real time information on how much you're consuming, um, how much power you're consuming, how much solar you're producing, what's the state of the battery, uh, how much money you have saved, how much GHG reduction that you have done, all sorts of information that you get here uh, as part of the dashboard. And one of the things that we do is when we do a portfolio, we try to put a large TV screen 
that shows the real time information on this and uh, on the, what's happening so that so that it becomes an education for the community and for people around it they come by and say oh yeah i like that you know what does that do because one of the goals that i believe when you do a microgrid for a city is to educate your community about the benefits of renewable energy and how this works you go to the next slide uh, actually skip to the ones that's called fleet charging design for 27 trucks uh, it's it's just an example of a model i don't think we need to go too much into it but the idea behind it is you go to the next slide linda it just shows that if you were to put a put a microgrid for fleet charging your payback period is quite quite short uh, primarily because fleet charging takes enormous amount of energy and in general microgrids the payback period is significantly smaller the larger the system the smaller the system the longer the payback period it would be go to the next slide which is uh i'm not i'm going to skip the next slide if you go to the one after that which is microgrid financing so one of the questions that you might ask as you think about all of these things is well this is all well and good but these things are expensive so I, how do i pay for it <laughs> so there are several options uh, obviously there's one viable option is ppa where you are essentially paying for power that you are using or generating depending on how the contract is done from a financier and the financier can be uh, anyone so in case of uh, san diego shell new energy is providing the financing and city is paying for it as if they would pay to the utility but at a much lower rate an example of that would be uh, san diego is paying about 24 cents and for the power and the microgrid whereas uh, sdge their blender rate is almost 36 cents so that's where the savings come from um, so that's one option which is ppa energy savings agreements are very similar it just has to do with guarantee versus non-guarantee and then there's of course the cash purchase uh, if you have city as a whole you can do cash purchase or you can take a loan and you can also pay for it the amount of incentives available in the markets are pretty significant uh, with the recent uh, ira bill inflation reduction act that was passed last year your itc which is investment tax credit is 30 percent and it wasn't available to non-taxable entities like cities but now you can get that money directly back uh, from the city you still have to file taxes for it but you'll get that money back so if you're if your system costs is two million dollars you get 30 percent of that back uh, from from uh, ira direct sometimes you can get a little bit more than that depending on certain criteria but we try to be conservative and say you know you get about 30 to 40 percent there's also s ship money which comes from your utility uh and that can be reasonable uh, that's on the battery size so once you combine all of that uh, your incentives are 60 to 70 percent uh if you do a ppa uh, typically you won't pay any down payment all the construction costs will be paid by the uh, company that's providing the financing and you are essentially paying for uh, purchasing power from that entity and you have no obligation. All the maintenance, everything is on uh, on that entity. So this is a an option that a lot of companies, a lot of cities uh, adopt. The only downside of PPA is the PPA cost of capital is slightly higher than what you would get otherwise uh, in the market. Uh, the cities probably can get a loan or lease uh, at a much lower rate uh, than a PPA. Um, if you go to the next slide, so if you were to do a cash purchase or loan, that means your city either has the money, sometimes you do, in case of Fontana, they, uh, they decided that they wanted to pay one and a half million of their own money towards, uh, towards microgrids, and we got another million and a half from Grant, and so they didn't need to do any PPA or anything for the microgrid portion. So some cities can do that, some cities want, want PPA, some cities 
can go get a, a loan or a bond. Um, the advantage of this is that your cost of capital is fairly low. Um, uh, the disadvantage is that you have to go and get the money. Uh, you have to do the administration of it and operation and maintenance. Um, in some ways, it becomes your responsibility. And of course, you can outsource that to, to companies like Bitscape, uh, but you still are responsible for, for maintaining that. So that's all I have. And I'll Great, thank you, Alok. I appreciate that. I can't believe we actually pulled that off with technology. So we are <laughs> behind schedule and Chanel is uh, on a tight schedule. And our real goal, folks, is not to answer all the questions. I see a lot of really great questions coming up. Um, we're going to share this power presentation to you in the end, but we want to take Chanel's time so she can get back to her work with uh, Congressman DeSaulnier and our sponsor, um, Sebastian Kahn at MCE. So if folks don't mind, if I could just barrel through with this, if there's some time under the peer-to-peer, -peer, Alok, maybe we'll have time for questions. I don't know if you can stick with us on the phone, but um, I'm going to go ahead and move it to Chanel, who's uh, elected in the city of Pittsburgh and has worked closely with MCE on a very exciting product uh, project there at the Unified School District, also a local government entity. Go ahead, Chanel. Thank you for waiting. <clears throat> Definitely. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Linda and the Contra Costa climate leaders uh, for the opportunity um, to speak here today. Um, my name is Chanel Scales Preston. Um, I'm the mayor of the city of Pittsburgh, and I also serve as the chair of MCE um, Board of Directors. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar uh, with MCE, um, MC is a local nonprofit community choice program um, that provides renewable electricity to over 370,000 residents, um, businesses throughout Contra Costa County. MCE is a joint powers authority and is governed by a board of local elected officials um, appointed by their city councils. Um, and county supervisors to serve on our organization. I serve as um, MCE's board uh, because I believe in local decision-making uh, is the way to achieving energy equality and equity. Um, community um, choice um, equips cities um, to develop, tailor, and fund renewable energy and sustainability initiatives. Um, to create their unique needs and um, priorities. Um, as the chair, <laughs> I've been able to work with my colleagues to foster greater environmental and economic benefits um, in our communities where we can make a meaningful impact at the local level. Um, I'm excited to be here today because this workshop aligns with a reincurring theme that policymakers like me um, often encounter in communities um, the importance of reliability and energy um, resilience. Um, community choice energy providers like MCE are uniquely equipped to address these types of issues. At MCE, we're investing heavily in new technologies that support a healthy electric grid and address um, energy equity. Um, particularly in the state, um, designated low income and disadvantaged um, communities. Um, at this time, I would like to uh, turn it over to um, Sebastian Kahn. He's our Senior Community Development Manager at MCE. Uh, Sebastian will give us an overview of a few exciting initiatives we are working on at MCE and how our agency is moving us towards a clean um, future. Sebastian. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor Scales Preston. Um, just wanted to check with Linda and the group. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Great, and are you seeing it in presenter view? Can you, can you see my notes at all? Nope, full screen, everything's good. Perfect. Perfect, well, thank you again, Mayor Scales Preston, and thank you to Contra Costa County Climate Leaders for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I see a number of members of the MCE board on this call. So uh, wanted to acknowledge uh, Mayor Murphy from Pinole who's joined us, 
uh, former MCU director Onoda from um, from Moraga, and also I saw Councilmember Nakamura from from Concord earlier today. So thank you all for taking the time to be here. Um, so quick introduction, Sebastian Kahn. I'm our senior community development manager at MCE. I've been with MCE for about four years, and in my role, uh, me and my team help oversee our relationships with cities and counties throughout our 37 member service area. So really excited to be here today, um, you know, because when me and my team are out in the community, uh, similar to what Mayor Skelos Preston uh, expressed, one of the top themes we come across is going all electric and resiliency and reliability and what all of that means. And in the discussions that I have with stakeholders, there's a recognition that as communities shift to an all electric environment, things like extreme weather, aging infrastructure, and increased energy demand uh, constrain and challenge grid reliability. And while that may be true, while we do want to acknowledge that, I think it's also imperative for us as local advocates, as staff, as policymakers, to highlight the fact that there are collaborative community-driven projects that are actively underway that are addressing these very issues. So I'll get into that a little bit with my presentation. Uh, but just quick background, um, thank, uh, a big thank you to Mayor Skills Preston for highlighting community choice programs. But for those of you that may not be familiar, CCAs are programs that essentially allow local jurisdictions to procure and provide electricity to residents and businesses in their communities. Uh, MCE was the first CCA in the state of California. We started serving customers in 2010, but since that time, there's been tremendous growth for the CCA model. There's now about 200 California towns, cities, and counties participating in a CCA program, and we serve collectively about 14 million customers. So widespread adoption of renewable energy in California has been made largely in part to the role of community choice. And then just a quick look at our service area at MCE and kind of who we serve. So obviously in Contra Costa County, um, Richmond was the first community that we started serving here, I believe in 2014. Um, and we've expanded to a majority of the Contra Costa cities as well. Uh, in addition to Solano County, Napa County, and of course Marin, uh, about 580,000 customer accounts in total. And Ultimately, the folks that are being served by MCE equates to about 1.5 million people throughout the Bay Area. So I'm really big on level setting and making sure that we work with shared definitions amongst the group. So I want to take a step back real quick and explain the concept of the grid, right? We hear that a lot, and I think it's important for us to have a common understanding of what we mean that what we, what we mean by that for these conversations. So we can all think of the grid like a large interconnected system that brings electricity from where it's made all the way to your home or business. And it has a few important points. The first on the far left-hand side of the screen here is what MCE is responsible for. It's the electricity generation. So you can think of this as the source of the power. And these are things essentially like factories that make electricity. You can think of solar plants, wind farms, um, and again, this is the, the source of the generation where the power is actually coming from. There's also transmission and distribution, kind of how the energy travels across the grid um, through infrastructure that's primarily managed, at least in the Bay Area, by pg and &E. So pg and &E is still involved. They're responsible for, for transmission and distribution. And the end case here is that for the electricity user with a CCA model of energy, you have a choice of where your energy is being generated from. You can choose pg and &E if you'd like, um, but MCE and Community Choice oftentimes offer a more renewable energy project, uh, product for you at cost competitive rates. So this is the grid in its essence. And when we talk about grid reliability, having that shared understanding of the grid is so important because it helps us as local government staff and advocates communicate better to our stakeholders. So why grid reliability matters? Um, you know, grid reliability really refers to how likely the network is to work normally at any given time. It's all about how well the electrical system is performing. So understanding the electric grid empowers community organizations and local government to ensure uninterrupted essential services, 
uh, prepare for and manage power disruptions and partner with organizations like MCE to help get the message out. So what I really wanna to highlight today in the next part of the presentation and building off of these themes um, are three pivotal aspects of energy management uh, that we've heard a little bit about today already. Demand response is a big one. We heard some of that from Brendan. Energy storage, we heard from Olak. And a new kind of theme that I wanna to introduce to this group is virtual power plants as well. So these are some of the things that are at the forefront of the energy landscape in California. And just to ground the conversation a bit, I think an important concept, a concept for us all to be aware of is that energy has price variability and different carbon intensities throughout the day. In the middle of the day, like right now, for example, uh, solar production across the state is at its highest. You know, most of our energy that we're using right now to power our laptops, to charge our phones is coming from solar in the afternoon. And that's a great thing, it's a renewable resource. But the challenge is that when the sun sets, that's typically when folks are getting off from work and returning home in the evening which is when energy demand spikes across the state. And we refer to that time period as peak times, four to 9 p.m. being the peak. Um, and I'll get into some of the technologies that we're advocating for at MCE to help alleviate the strain on the grid at that time. But for right now, I wanna talk about energy conservation. Um, electricity providers across the state are, are encouraging folks to shift their energy use to the morning or early afternoon when energy costs less and is powered by greener sources. And we can do that by avoiding using major appliances like dishwashers, using fans instead of air conditioning and unplugging unused appliances. At MCE, we're supporting that messaging a little bit with our new uh, emotional outlets campaign. Have you ever looked at an electric outlet? Kind of looks like a face. Um, so here is where the emotional outlet piece of that comes from. Um, so really just encouraging 4 to 9 p.m. savings and kind of dovetailing on that a little bit to a theme that Brendan talked about earlier today is uh, flex alerts and demand response. So these are a little bit different than energy, converse, conversation, or con energy conservation, excuse me. The main difference is that demand response um, focuses on urgent short-term adjustments that need to be made when there are times of increased grid strain um, and issues with grid reliability. So when the state of California calls for a flex alert, um, that's an emergency situation where folks need to conserve energy to maintain reliability for the grid. And if you all remember correctly, in September of last year, around this time, there was a nine day period where we had flex alerts throughout the state of California. And luckily at MCE, we have a program that helps compensate customers for saving energy during that time period. And so Contra Costa County specifically was really a great case study of that. Um, we worked with Brendan and his team to really identify what were the most highest energy consuming buildings and how can we make small tweaks in their operations to ensure that not only the customer can save some money during those four to 9 p.m. windows, but that we can also increase grid reliability. So, all in all, over that nine day period um, through compensation from MCE as part of our program, the county was able to earn over $15,000 in incentives on top of an additional $3,000 in bill savings that they used by moving their energy use outside of those four to 9 p.m. windows. So demand response is a great tool in the toolbox and another technology that's received a lot of increased attention is battery storage. So batteries do a few useful things, as we've heard about from a lock today. Uh, they enable daily peak load management. And what that means is that batteries are able to store excess energy during low demand periods in the middle of the day when the sun is shining and releasing it during peak demand uh, from 4 to 9 p.m. Batteries also serve as crucial backup power during grid outages, like a PSPS event, for example, ensuring continuity for essential services at hospitals, community facilities, and schools. And one item that's not listed here that I think is crucial um, is that battery systems empower community facilities to become more energy independent and reduce reliance on the grid. Batteries are called distributed energy resources, which we talked a little bit about today. But to break it down just a little bit more, 
that term really allows for people to make their own electricity on site instead of getting it from a big power plant. And distributed energy resources like batteries are allowing customers to have more control and autonomy um, of over their energy needs. That's important because it results in cost savings for the customer, ensures con continuity of operations during a grid outage, and supports a cleaner grid overall. So just to give kind of a local perspective on this, uh, I do want to give a quick case study of what MCE has been working on with Pittsburgh Unified School District. This is a solar plus storage pilot program, which provides backup battery storage to critical community facilities. And the goal with MCE's energy storage program has been to develop and implement dispatchable behind the meter battery energy storage systems in partnership with customers and really prioritizing those in state designated low income and disadvantaged communities. I will say Pittsburgh Unified has done a really great job of being an ambassador, ambassador of sustainable energy. Um, they've installed energy storage at 10 campuses throughout their school districts. Um, they've also done things like buying electric buses. They have two electric buses serving all of their students. Um, and they've installed 22 electric vehicle charging stations across all of their campuses as well. So kind of how MCE's involvement with this project worked was that we were able to design um, in partnership with our vendors, a backup battery storage system for 10 of the campuses. We provided about $715,000 in funding to Pittsburgh Unified uh, to help pay for about 1.6 megawatts or three megawatt hours of battery storage. And what this will do over a seven year period um, will actually save the school district about $2.8 million in bills. So not only will they have that backup uh, resilience in the event of an outage, but they're gonna be saving a substantial amount of money on their energy bills, which for a school district that's budgeting um, and you know, trying to prioritize student needs uh, in a cost-effective way, this is obviously a great way for them to be able to support their mission. So we've talked a little bit about microgrids um, throughout the course of the presentation today, but what I also want to highlight are the benefits of virtual power plants. Um, so in addition to standalone battery storage, like the example of Pittsburgh Unified, MCE is also thinking a lot about virtual power plants. Um, so what these are, are decentralized systems. It's a power source that's made up of multiple smaller geographically dispersed energy assets. So typically when we think of the grid, you think of the generation source that's very far away, it could be a solar farm in the Central Valley, for example, tied into the grid, and that energy goes long distances over transmission and distribution lines, ultimately to the home or business that it's going to serve. VPPs are very different from that. It's basically an energy management system that allows batteries to communicate with each other in real time over advanced software to kind of alleviate the need for that long distance travel of the energy. You know, being able to create it on site and share information with one another in real time. So let's have, let's say you have a home or a business that's state of the art from an energy efficiency standpoint. You, know, you have solar on your roof, you have a battery, you have a smart thermostat, that's great, but that facility is only one home. So the idea with virtual power plants is that how do we get these devices in people's homes to communicate and collaborate with one another to manage peak loads um, and dispatch power to the grid during flex alerts or PSPS events when the need, uh, you know, without that need for new capital infrastructure interconnecting all of those facilities. And this is important, um, I think, from a community equity standpoint, you know, it, and it brings us to Richmond, which is where we're planning to launch our, our first virtual power plant at MCE, um, not too far from where I think many of us are located. And as we know, asthma and environmental hazards have been intertwined in Richmond's history. The city's industrial development and proximity to oil refineries along that waterfront have contributed to significant pollution. And today, Richmond is actually in the 99th percentile of asthma rates across the state of California. Uh, and with that in mind, we at MCE were notified by the city of Richmond uh, about a year ago 
um, about a grant from the California Energy Commission that they were partnering on to address energy equity. And so by coupling a couple different funding streams, we're hoping to build out a virtual power plant in Richmond to give folks more access to renewable energy options, but also benefiting the air quality in Richmond, California, which we think is so important. Um, a key tenet of this program is focusing on zero net carbon homes, both for existing residences and for first time low income home buyers. So in addition to the Energy Commission grant that I mentioned, uh, the city of Richmond in partnership with the Richmond Community Foundation has an existing program made possible by a social impact bond that rehabilitates abandoned properties and promotes local home ownership. And so this bond is being used to actually acquire abandoned homes at auction. And once that happens, income eligible families are able to purchase homes at below market rate. As part of that rehabilitation process for the homes, MCE and our partners are incorporating technologies like solar, batteries, and heat pumps to participate in the virtual power plant. So not only are low-income families able to purchase a home and build that generational wealth through the home itself, the value of the home is also increased because of the new energy efficient technologies, which is fantastic because it, it boosts home value and addresses energy equity at the same time. And by involving these homes in a virtual power plant, we shift from a mode of passive energy consumption under the traditional power plant model to reducing energy costs because all of that energy is being generated on site, particularly during peak hours and addressing some of the energy burdens that these families might see um, out the out, out, at the outset. So yeah, that's one of the couples that recently purchased um, one of these homes. So. A big congratulations to the new homeowners. And so our goal with the VPP in 2025 is a collective um, 1.5 megawatts of flexible load, a megawatt of solar, and two megawatt hours of behind the meter energy storage. And our goal eventually is to grow this to all four of MCE counties, um, you know, offering that same value to about 63,000 customers in the long term. And what we're interested too is to allow for these systems to join California's energy marketplace to buy and sell electricity services like any other participant, like a solar farm or a peaker plant, just like they would sell their energy to electricity providers. Also, we're interested in maintaining that relationship to our customers and our intent is to compensate customers for their participation in the VPP through on-bill credit structures. So just one kind of innovative way that we're thinking about reliability at MCE. And that concludes the presentation for today. I'm, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but happy to answer any if they come up. Well, we've got a whole lot of questions is the problem. And uh, I see Alok managed to find, join us. <laughs> we can see your handsome face now. But um, what I'm thinking is uh, Alok, Chanel, um, Brendan, if you're still with us, um, Sebastian, if you could put your contact info in the chat. Um, you know, I, in a weird way, I'm not going to apologize. My goal for this is for people like myself, a former mayor, and a few people on this call today who, um, you know, they've got a busy schedule and maybe they're going to look at this later when it shows up on a city council agenda and they'll go back to our website because all the materials will be there. But we've got some great questions. Van asking about municipal bonds can be used to finance. Jody's asking if we're the largest load served by MCE. I think we are, you know, trying to figure out a little bit more for, you know, are these going to support resilience hubs? Paul's asking about thermal energy. Carol Weed's asking about California legislation. You know, you guys, we could be on this all day, but my goal is so that people can actually get back to work, get back to their busy days. So at the end of this, I will be handing out uh, everyone's contact information. You know, Chanel, Alok, Brendan, Sebastian, if you put your info in there and if you see in the chat and want to answer some of those questions, we'll save the chat. But I'd love to, um, one of the things we've heard back, we've only got 10 more minutes, I try to end on time, is we've been doing these workshops since 2007 and everyone like, we wanna hear from our peers. We don't just want a presentation from Gridscape and MCE and we wanna hear from our peers. I was hoping Devin Murphy was with us, but um, I don't think Devin, if you're there, can you raise your hand? Maybe he dropped off. 
I'll just say briefly, Devin Murphy has been a great champion in the city of Pinole. He's the 81st mayor of Pinole. He's taken his whole city team up for a, um, a, a field trip. They're going up to the uh, Blue Lake Rancheria uh, next month to uh, actually go together to see what's going on up there. You know, I encourage you to, I wanted Devin to speak briefly about why he's championing such a move, but I think it's really important for folks to know who each other are. And hopefully the few people we still have left on this call, we had 48, we're down to 37, are, are feeling the love and getting to know each other and can get your questions asked. I actually would like to invite, we actually had, uh, you know, a lot of people on this call are from Walnut Creek and from uh, local advocates from Sustainable Rossmore, Sustainable Walnut Creek. I had asked Brad Wait if you're still on, uh, on with us to, uh, they ran into some issues and he's got a statement that a number of them have put together and um, maybe later Sebastian, Alok and others can um, answer, you know, how did we get past that? But um, Brad, if you're still there and want to kind of just tell us what, We've got movers and shakers. Rossmore is a senior community, and they're the type of community that would really benefit from this. But um, Brad, can you tell us a little bit? And then I'll, you know, keep it short, kind of like public comment. We're all familiar. Keep it to one or two minutes, and then maybe we can hear from a couple other people too. Great. Can you hear me, Linda? Yeah. Great. Um, those that don't know, Rossmore is a retirement community of almost ten thousand people in Walnut Creek on the Lafayette border. Um, and in 2021, a group of about 40 Ro uh, Rossmore residents, led by the same Rossmore, attempted to create a microgrid model that each of the of our 23 homeowners associations, ranging in size from 25 to 1,800 homes, could implement for the benefit of the residents. The concept was to build sufficient shared solar and battery capacity that the entire HOA could separate itself from the grid long enough to ride through a typical PGD PSPS. We identified the technology necessary to accomplish this goal. We recruited a private equity company, which invested over $100,000 in our project to devise a public private partnership to fund the operation of such a system. We also devised a power purchase agreement model to pay for the in this system over 20 years at a price of about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Unfortunately, in addition to political barriers within Rossmore, we also ran into regulatory, regulatory barriers at the state level. The biggest barrier is that PGD has a monopoly on selling electricity in Northern California. This means that, that the electricity generated from one homeowner's solar panels cannot be used to power their next door neighbor, and that, that and neighbors cannot share a battery to store solar power. Again, remember, this was a couple of years ago. In order to accomplish our goals, we would like to have have had to, we would have would have had to set up our own utility company, something an HOA is not allowed to do. However, a municipality can do this. Um, obviously, Palo Alto and Alameda are excellent local examples of municipalities that operate their own uh, utility companies. Um, you know, and so it seems to us that the cities of Contra Costa County are, are to deliver resilient, renewable, and low cost electro, electro power to the residents especially those, those like us in HOAs, they may have to take over operating the municipal, municipal electrical grids. And so and that's, uh, that's basically where we are. We'd love to revisit this, but um, hopefully, hopefully things have changed since then. It's so again, we're not going to really have time to answer all these questions. Um, I think connecting everybody is the most important thing. Um, so I don't know, uh, I'm sure some of you have some very quick responses to that, but, um, you know, pg e declined to join us today. I don't know what's going on, as we said, with California legislation, what's going on with new opportunities. Um, you know, I'm sure even perhaps Igor, who's on here, has some thoughts on that, but I think I'm just going to have to rush us through because I really want people to um, end on time. Surely, if people want to stay on this afterwards, I'd encourage you to do that. I'll uh, officially close the session as close to two as I can, stop the reporting, and then maybe if others, Brad Alok is asking you to contact him. Everybody will um, I'll get a copy of this recording, and there'll be a fact sheet, and uh, I just want you all to know where to go to get your answers and maybe revisit this. Um, another organization that's on with us today um, and has an upcoming meeting, 
uh, Alok mentioned briefly about IRA monies. I think Sebastian might have touched on that. Um, Arthur bought Williams, Jackie Mann, 350 Contra Costa. I understand there's going to be, um, there's an Contra Costa has formed a uh, IRA network of sorts. We really, with Jody, with Brendan, with others, myself, others are really trying to figure out how do we get some of that IRA money for good work in Contra Costa. So um, if you're on there, Arthur, and just wanted to briefly, same thing, give one or two minutes. And then I don't know if Jackie or Marty want to tell us about the, I think the date is to be confirmed, but there is this IRA network in our county, in Contra Costa County. Certainly welcome. We've got cities far and wide from Foster City, Santa Barbara, uh, Santa, one of the Santas, sorry, uh, San Diego, I think Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to focus on Contra Costa, but Arthur, can you just give us a brief update uh, and maybe um, Jackie, I think, is on uh, any uh, finalization on the um, on the date for the next workshop. Uh, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi. Well, hi. My name is Arthur Bart Williams. Um, my uh, day job as Executive Director for Grid uh, Alternatives Bay Area. Um, and as uh, Linda mentioned, I'm on the steering committee for this uh, network uh, for Contra Costa County around the IRA, uh, Inflation Reduction Act effort. Um, actually, if Marty was on the call, I would defer to her, but I'll, since I'll, you got me talking, I'll just go. Um, we have a tentative date uh, for this workshop. So there was a workshop in a uh, meeting in April that brought together 350 Contra Costa um, spearheaded and brought together just a really um, fascinating group of of, of uh, nonprofits, government agencies, uh, small businesses, community organizers. And it was so uh, successful that we are doing, uh, uh, continuing it with uh, what we're trying to be quarterly workshops. So the next one is scheduled for, uh, tentative scheduled for November the 9th. Um, and it'll include um, a panel discussion that we're working through. And the topic of that discussion actually is how can we accelerate energy generation and storage in Contra Costa County, particularly in low income environmental justice communities. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, given the time constraint, I'll just stop there unless there's anything else I missed Linda. Um, what was the date for that? November 29th? November 9th. November, November 9th. 9th, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, Lisa, do you wanna um, chime in on that briefly? Lisa's with 350 Contra Costa. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll be um, hopefully uh, more information will be coming out in the next couple of weeks on that date and the event. It's going to be hosted at Rise in Richmond at the center there. It's face to face. We're hoping to get um, people from cities, uh, from the county, from organizations, uh, uh, climate um, based organizations and uh, community-based organizations and as Arthur said you know the focus area is going to be on um, you know what can be done around uh, microgrids and um, electrification and things like that and we're also going to do some updates on the Inflation Reduction Act and where that's going um, and if anybody wants to join the uh, group that we've set up, it's the um, CCC and IRA network, we're calling it. And if you, it's easy to join, just email me at lisa at 350contracosta.org. And I can add you to the Google group and I can add you to the information that's coming out. Um, we don't bombard you with information, but as, as information is coming out, and um, we'll be sending out a more general email about the event as well. Thank you, Lisa. And I think you put that in the chat. We've got uh, three more minutes. We actually have a couple of electeds from Concord before we close out. I always like to make sure. Actually, we've got a few electeds from other cities, but Concord had a great turnout here today. So I'm kind of curious either from, uh, I think the mayor, Laura Huffmeister is not here. I don't know, Carlin, if you're still with us, former uh, recent past mayor, is there anything Concord might want to share? I wondered if there was something exciting going on with microgrids in Concord and the Naval Weapons Station. And if I'm putting you on the spot, uh, don't raise your hand. But if uh, you think you might want to pipe in, um, go ahead and put your hand up and we can bring you up into panel statement. And while you're thinking if you might want to do that, somebody from Concord, um, I just want to again let folks know 
that all of the resources today are going to be in a one page fact sheet. All of this has been recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel as well as Facebook Live. Um, I encourage you to follow us on Facebook. We've actually got daily posts where we're sharing best practices. We are actually looking to hire an intern. Uh, our current person is doing those daily uh, Facebook posts is moving on if someone wants to do that. Um, we have a scorecard and Andrew, who's been our great uh, host with the mostest over here, uh, is our, our um, code writer and he's got some really great things happening for us and possibly the other nine counties. We're looking to share how our scorecard ranking cities might uh, be applied um, beyond Contra Costa County and become a uniform across the way. So I encourage you to check out that. Andrew, you can put our website in the chat for us. Um, but want to just keep moving that along, see how we can keep moving policy, you know, the um, wall of fame. We want to keep featuring all these best case study examples that we heard about some today. And uh, sounds like some people are, are, thank you, Sebastian, for joining us. And uh, I'm not seeing it. Concord wants to dive in as politics go and being a former elected official myself, you can't really make a statement. Um, you know, out in the public, but I do, I'm excited that so many people came from so many different cities. Um, is there anybody else I missed on that wants to make one last comment before I go ahead and close this up about something you're working on in your city? Um, I was kind of excited to see West County Wastewater on. Is there anyone who'd like to raise their hand and uh, just let us know if there's something exciting that uh, that you're working on? Give that a minute. Do you see any hands at all out there, Andrew? If not, that's a okay too. Like I said, as a former elected official as well, um, I'm just glad that we can provide this opportunity. I hope you've met some new people, made some new friends, uh, got some new contacts, and uh, you know we're in an emergency situation. We're all feeling the the pressure from from what we're under, and I think this was a very timely workshop. And I'm very excited to follow up. Um, Carol, I do want to um, notes that our assemblywoman, uh, Rebecca Barr Kahane, um, has a, uh, a presentation on October 3rd. Carol, if you're still on, you might put that in the chat. Uh, again, I think you posted it earlier. Just want to um, make sure that everybody's using all that we can for our resources. Apologies to the speakers that we got a little late and apologies that uh, we don't have a lot of time for Q&A, but it's exactly 2 p.m., and uh, I'm going to officially close and stop the uh, reporting. Um, Carol, actually, did you want to um, speak or just put it in the uh, in the chat? I see uh, Carol Weed. 